Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 worst movie villains of the century so far. I like being bad. It makes me happy. For this list, we'll be looking at the most lackluster, ineffective, or altogether forgettable evildoers that have appeared in movies since the year 2000. Did we forget an infamously bad villain for this list? Let us know in the comments down below. Number 20, The Mandarin, Iron Man 3. Initially, it seemed like Ben Kingsley was portraying the diabolical Mandarin character in Iron Man 3. However, Tony Stark eventually discovers that the villain everyone saw on TV was actually an actor working for the real and wealthy mastermind named Killian. You said you wanted the Mandarin. You're looking right at him. Who's always me, Tony? Right from the start. I am the Mandarin! Unfortunately, the rich crime lord's motivations come down to little more than greed and a petty grudge against Stark. Killian's shallow character was coupled with the fact that Kingsley's considerable talent was dedicated to comedy instead of drama. They gave me things. They gave me this palace. They gave me plastic surgery. They gave me things. Did you just nod off? The entire Mandarin ruse felt like a cruel bait and switch. Admittedly, Mickey Rorick's whiplash from Iron Man 2 was another pretty bad Iron Man villain. But the Mandarin was such a letdown that the studio made fun of him in Shang-Chi. But because he didn't know my actual name, he invented a new one. Do you know the name he chose? The Mandarin. He gave his figurehead the name of a chicken dish. Number 19, Sister Summer's Owl and her followers, The Wicker Man. In The Wicker Man remake, Nicolas Cage became a meme for his glorious overacting in the film but he wasn't the only one. Welcome, Mr. Malis. You have come of your own free will to keep this appointment with the Wicker Man. When Cage's Malis character arrives on a mysterious island looking for a missing girl, he runs into various members of a secretive cult. But none of these antagonists are all that distinct. They all pretend to be nice while obviously being sinister, have no personal motivations, and have no distinct character traits. Even their leader, played by the great Ellen Burstyn, couldn't shine above the rest. You don't criticize what you know nothing about. When she and her minions eventually capture the hero, the whole finale feels more like a comedy than the horror it was going for. These over-the-top villains don't deserve the honey they sacrifice Malus for. The drone must die! The drone must die! The drone must die! Number 18. Parallax, Green Lantern, a Hal Jordan played by Ryan Reynolds, went up against the evil Parallax in this hated adaptation of the DC comic. Your will is strong, but not strong enough. You are nothing without the ring. Since the fear-based villain is mostly composed of CGI effects, there's no part of this villainous entity that feels real or tangible. The otherworldly essence could have helped bring in an interesting climax to this adventure. However, it just participates in a bland action sequence. It certainly doesn't help that Parallax's extremely generic goals of world destruction make his actions incredibly boring. As the final nail in the coffin, Parallax's servant Hector Hammond gives a Razzie worthy performance that never comes off as threatening. Just as much of a failure as I was. I just as afraid. The only thing scary about these villains is how quickly they made the movie tank with audiences. Number 17, Toy Maker, Spy Kids 3D, Game Over. For the third entry in director Robert Rodriguez's Spy Kids series franchise, the story added a big bad named Toy Maker, who was played by Sylvester Stallone. All I wanted to do was right the wrongs, start over a new world, a new chance where everyone would get a second chance but no seeing the action star in a kids movie is already jarring but it's his persona that feels the most out of place here while it's usually fun to see stallone's intimidating demeanor it doesn't fit in with the goofy energy of the piece 
To make matters worse, he also shows up in additional roles where he has to talk to himself in a variety of strange voices. It's not about the right thing, it's about the smart thing. We won't escape this place otherwise. I speak for all of us when I say, we want out! None of Stallone's attempts at comedy elicit so much as a chuckle from us. We'd like to return this toy maker to the store. Game. Number 16, Slender Man, Slender Man. Filmmakers were hoping to translate all of the terror of this creepypasta character Slender Man to the screen. This take on the viral fable follows girls who try to confront the title character. While Slender Man might be interesting in an internet post or video game, he doesn't necessarily translate well to this specific film. The movie investigates the mystery surrounding the supernatural villain without ever really finding his true potential. <laughs> While cast members like Joey King are convincingly afraid of the giant, Slenderman himself isn't all that spooky on his own. For those who want a truly terrifying experience, it's best to go back to the source material. Number 15, Green Goblin, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 has a trio of lackluster villains. While Electro's design was cool, his odd characterization made him unrelatable. No, stop! Don't do that! Please! Wait! It's not my fault! He came in after Paul Giamatti used a ridiculous Russian accent to annoy us while yelling most of his lines. <laughs> However, it's the Green Goblin that lets us down the most. Oh, God, I'm sorry. That's just not the answer we were looking for. The audience is supposed to be sympathetic to Dane DeHaan's Harry Osborn because he's a close friend of Peter's who's dying of a mysterious illness. But since we barely spend any time with him, we feel nothing and his Osborne comes off like a privileged and impatient child whenever he's actually on screen. By the time DeHaan suited up and attempted a creepy laugh, we were already over his Green Goblin. Harry, what did you do? What you made me do. You were my friend, and you betrayed me! Number 14, Laurel Hader, Catwoman. Catwoman didn't exactly impress audiences with its zany interpretation of the titular character. If you somehow look past the problems with her, you'll find Sharon Stone's turn as Laurel Hader impossible to ignore. I'm a woman, love. I'm used to doing all kinds of things I don't want to do. During the film, she discovers a beauty cream can give her nearly impenetrable skin, but it also risks ruining a face forever if it isn't used regularly. For some reason, Hader thinks getting people hooked on a product that could make them threats is a good plan. Outside her baffling business idea, her obsession with her own beauty and money makes her an incredibly shallow antagonist. I was everything they wanted me to be. I was never more beautiful, never more powerful. And then I turned 40 and they threw me away. Hader predictably fails at everything she tries to achieve, but she did succeed at being the worst part of 2004's Catwoman. Number 13, Blackbeard, Pan. For this prequel of J.M. Barry's tale, Hugh Jackman was tasked with bringing life to the infamously menacing pirate. Although he has the acting chops to play a really strong villain, it never quite clicks in a compelling way in this fairy tale. Now kneel. I said Neil! His black beard never feels like a true terror of the seas. There's also a misguided attempt to cater to fans of Jackman's musical chops. While there's nothing wrong seeing the actor belt out a tune, there's something strange about seeing Blackbeard singing along to Smells Like Teen Spirit. Where the lights out, this is dangerous. Here we are now, hesitate us! This tonal inconsistency made it impossible to take him seriously. Even Jack Sparrow comes off as more intimidating than this version of Blackbeard. Number 12, Enchantress, Suicide Squad. Many DC fans wish they could forget the 2016 version of Suicide Squad. 
While there's a bunch of villains that disappointed us, Enchantress danced her way onto our radars immediately. Hey, everyone can see all this trippy magic stuff, right? Yeah, why? I'm off my meds. This villain freed herself from imprisonment by possessing the body of an innocent archaeologist. Despite the interesting premise, Enchantress is incredibly generic. She instantly decides to destroy the world within a few minutes of taking control. Additionally, most of her scenes are full of obscene amounts of CG. And the less that's said about her weird magical dancing, the better. But it is our time. The sun is setting and the magic rises. The metahumans are a sign of change. Lady, you are evil! Cara Delevingne did her best to make the flat character compelling. But in the end, many people found Enchantress as the worst antagonist in a squad full of villainous duds. Number 11, Malekith the Accursed, Thor the Dark World. Quick, do you remember the villain of Thor the Dark World? If not, you wouldn't be alone. Who are you? I am Malekith, and I would have what is mine. Malekith the Accursed is far from the most memorable villain in the MCU. He got off to a rough start when his backstory saw him sacrifice his own people when he was losing a war. After failing to win us over in the beginning, he spends most of the movie standing around with a blank expression. You think you can stop this? The ether cannot be destroyed. But you can. Even though Christopher Eccleston is no slouch as an actor, he can't make Malekith interesting. Maybe it would have been better if he embraced a more humorous side to stand out among all the CG and confusing plot. If he had, maybe we wouldn't have so much trouble remembering this villain even existed. Number 10, Lucian Crown, aka Milo, Morbius. The issue surrounding Morbius and its release became the source of many memes. Matt Smith's role as Lucian, aka Milo, is among the reasons this movie became an ironic watch for people. Milo, you have to stop. You have to stop. You have to stop denying who you are. It's boring. We can go anywhere. We can do anything. Let's go. Let's have some fun. Counter to some of the film's darker imagery involving vampires, the villain is shown in a variety of moods that make us question the tone of the overall piece. His most famous scene is a dance that whipped up the internet into a frenzy. When Milo isn't dancing with himself, he's preying on victims for vague reasons. But it's hard to even take those scenes seriously. You know what they say, tequila to remember, whiskey to forget. His silly villain drove a stake right through the heart of the serious tone the movie tried to maintain. Number 9, The Bye Bye Man. The Bye Bye Man. The Bye Bye Man failed to garner many positive reviews upon its release in 2017. One of the biggest reasons a horror film will fail is because the main villain is either over or underdeveloped. In this case, there's definitely way too much backstory. What does this mean? What did you write? I don't understand. He makes you see things, and he makes you do things. Who knows how many good people he's made do horrible things like this. The main characters have to deal with an apparent curse that drives people mad. After destroying people's lives, the King of Bad Vibes finally makes an appearance after the cast struggles to understand the lore behind him. Go ahead, kill me. You win. The final reveal isn't particularly exciting either. Unfortunately, the Bye Bye Man's form isn't that unique when compared to other horror characters. Thanks to his uninspired appearance and convoluted story, this villain had to say bye-bye to any chance at a franchise. Number 8, Steppenwolf, Justice League. 2017's Justice League was a controversial release in the DC Universe for making a number of controversial choices. At the top of its pile of problems stood Steppenwolf. Mother, millennia in exile, searching. At last, you call me home. You will not like your welcome. Actor Kieran Hines brings a lot of gravitas to the role with his vocal performance. However, it's all made meaningless by a character who doesn't seem to have a clear motivation for miles. Why does everyone keep telling me that? We never fully understand why the baddie is trying so hard to unite three plot devices into one. 
Thankfully, Zack Snyder's Justice League put a lot more effort into explaining what Steppenwolf was all about. You betrayed him. Your own family. I saw my mistake. Fans should definitely stick to watching that version of the antagonist instead of the paper-thin alien in the 2017 version. Number 7. Loki, Son of the Mask a major reason why Son of the Mask is one of the worst comedy sequels of all time comes down to its big bad. Bro, listen, I'm a god. I can shapeshift. I can create stuff out of nothingness. I can alter the fabric of reality. So please, quit being a knucklehead. During the story, they had a great idea to make the trickster god Loki into the villain. He was mainly focused on trying to get his hands on the iconic mask to appease his dad, Odin. Despite having all the powers of a god, he strangely struggles to achieve a single task. We'd be able to accept that if Loki's failures were at least funny. But despite being played by the awesome and hilarious Alan Cumming, we found ourselves frowning more than laughing. By the time we reached the underwhelming climax, we wished Odin would have forced Loki to leave Earth earlier. Maybe now I can help you patch things up with mom? Don't push it. Number 6, Venom, Spider-Man 3. So, where to? <laughs> After the triumph of the first two Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, fans were disappointed that he had to juggle too many villains in the third installment. The most hated and least effective rogue in that film had to be Venom. I'm begging you, if you do this, I will lose everything. There's not a paper in town that will hire me. You should have thought of that earlier. Topher Grace's performance as Eddie Brock works well enough until he finds himself bonded with an alien symbiote. His transformation into Venom happens way too late in the film to give his story the attention it deserves. And although Eddie's supposed to be a strong villain, he comes off as a whiny nerd. Do you remember? Do you remember what you did to me? The antagonist also receives a sudden send-off that makes the screen time he stole from the other two villains more insulting. Venom was truly a parasite to this film. Number 5. Belema Brassix, Jupiter Ascending After Eddie Redmayne managed to win a Best Actor Oscar and Worst Performer Razzie back-to-back. -back. Double our security deployment to destroy any ship that comes near the planet. As the villain of Jupiter Ascending, the actor's performance is memorable for all the wrong reasons. He tries to make big and bold choices in every one of his scenes. However, Redmayne's line delivery and emotions are so all over the place that his scenes rarely ever work. I create life! And I destroy it. He often made what should be heavy and weighty scenes feel like soap opera parodies. On one hand, Redmayne's ridiculous attempt at villainy made parts of Jupiter Ascending's story interesting. But that fact can't hide that he's objectively terrible at being a villain. It's better to accept this than to pretend it isn't true. Number 4. Doctor Doom, Fantastic Four While there are a multitude of problems with this film, Doctor Doom ultimately spelled, well, Doom for this movie. Victor, don't do this! There is no Victor. There is only Doom. This update of the Marvel Mastermind doesn't make a significant impression in the first half of the movie. Since the bulk of the narrative focused on giving the Central Quartet attention, the villain feels like an afterthought at times. By the time the plot circles back to Doom, he's given some bland scenes to try out his powers. The CGI that prevents him from making expressions is paired with a vocal effect that muffles his voice. To top it all off, his generic goal is to, say it with us now, destroy the world. It's too late, Susan. The Earth is dying. Humanity had its chance. Doom's bad characterization ensured this movie went out with a whimper. Number 3. Turo, Battlefield Earth John Travolta's passion project Battlefield Earth often ranks low on the Legends filmography. This is partly due to Travolta's terrible attempt at playing the villainous Terrell. Whenever he's on screen, he chews up every bit of scenery that he can find. While you were still learning how to spell your name, 
I was being trained to conquer galaxies. Taro's bizarre speaking pattern and constant overreactions to small inconveniences make it difficult to see him as anything but a clown. Outside of questionable acting, Taro also has the burden of trying to explain all the complex ins and outs of the source material. The planet ship is hiding something. All we have to do is find out what it is. Then we'll have leverage over him. And then we can get the gold. What do you mean we? It's my plan. It's hard to understand either the dialogue or Travolta's acting choices in this infamous sci-fi bomb. Number two, the Joker, Suicide Squad. Since a few people had made iconic turns as the Joker before him, Jared Leto was facing an uphill battle when he joined Suicide Squad. He ended up falling far below expectations when he appeared on screen. I can tell you meant that. Yeah. Ah. Ah. You're gonna be my friend. Before the film even came out, Leto was said to have pranked and antagonized his co-stars in the true spirit of the fictional clown. Whether that helped him build the role or not, the actor's method approach didn't seem to benefit his performance. Oh, I'm not gonna kill you. I'm just gonna hurt you really, really bad. Leto's gestures and vocal performance are way too over the top to be taken seriously. His version of the supervillain doesn't make great use of the limited screen time either. While Joker's usually still the show, many wish this performance was just edited out of the movie. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Lex Luthor, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Jesse Eisenberg wasn't necessarily an obvious choice to play Superman's intimidating nemesis. While the Academy Award nominated actor is good at playing geniuses, he failed to capture the scarier aspects of Lex Luthor. The red capes are coming. The red capes are coming. Although Eisenberg tries to inject hints of menace into all of the villain's monologues, it just mainly sounds like he's making random choices to keep things interesting. Books are knowledge and knowledge is power. And I am, <laughs> no, I, um, no, what am I? I, what was I saying? It's truly impossible to tell if we're going to get a quirky Lex or heinous supervillain until Eisenberg starts a scene. And despite the fact that he's supposed to be extremely intelligent, his grand plan doesn't feel like it makes much sense. The greatest gladiator match in the history of the world, God versus man, day versus night. Son of Krypton versus Bat of Gotham. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.